a story of discovery, of a great new continent by a great man. And like many stories, it begins with a boy. Christopher and his younger brother Bartholomew helped their father by collecting wool from the sheep herds near Genoa. It was an important trade and enough to occupy the ordinary boy, but not Christopher. Genoa was a Mediterranean seaport, and it was here that young Columbus, while still too young to sail, learned his love for the sea. Every time he could get away, Christopher would leave his chores to run off to the shipyard and listen to tales of riches and adventure. And their roofs were covered with gold, and they wore diamonds, rubies, and satin robes. Did, did you see them? No, but my friend did. Did you know Marco Polo? No, he's been dead for many years. But my father's father saw him in Venice once, after Marco had made his long trip to China, which we call Cathay. Every sailor, every merchant knows what Marco told him of his visit to Copanio. A distant island where the king hath a mighty palace, all roofed with finest gold. And the windows of the palace are decorated with gold. And the floors, even the floors are paved with the precious stuff. Two fingers thick. Two fingers thick, Christopher. Did you hear me? Two fingers thick. Well, Christopher, when are you going to grow up so that you can sail to the ends of the earth and see its wonders? Are you going to sail clear to Cafe or to the Indies? Or even fall off the end of it and never see your mother or father again? Or home? Even Genoa? Look, boy, we've no more time. Off with you now. There's wool to be called. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher, my boy, from the trees of Seville, a sailing man gave it to me. But, sire, if the earth is flat, why do not the oceans run off its sides, as the water drains from my father's vineyards? Christopher, my boy, the earth is as flat as this orange. But this orange is round. So is the earth, son. People don't think so. But we who know the sea are sure the earth is round. Of course. It has yet to be proven. But why? With all our ships and men who sail. <laughs> you are a curious boy. Perhaps it is because there has not yet been a sailor with your curiosity and the courage to see it through. <laughs> Run along now, but come back soon. And so a curious boy grew into manhood. Genoa and his father's house were but a memory. He went to sea first as a youth, and in a few years he knew more about ships than most men twice his age. But there were still things to be learned, mathematics and astronomy, the knowledge of charted waters, and the fear of waters uncharted. Bartholomew. Yes, brother. Here it is, my new trade route to Cathay. And to certain death, brother. Do you know what you've done? You've shown a western passage. Why, it was impossible. Do you remember when we were children and we traveled to Milano? Yes. And you cried because you were afraid? Yes. You'd not cry now if we were to go to Milano? Oh, of course not. But we're not children any longer. Men act as children only when they don't know where they're going. I am sure that by sailing west, I will find a shorter route from Europe to Asia. And such a route has been badly needed since the Turks have captured Constantinople, dear brother. But who would risk his money or his life to make good such a dream? A letter for Christopher Columbus. Thank you. It is from Dr. Toscanelli. The great scholar and astrologer? Yes. He agrees with me. Toscanelli says I am right. The earth is round, and he will help me to prove it. You ask me who would risk his life and fortune? Ha <laughs> ha! It'll be my life and the money of Don John, King of Portugal. Patience, brother. Patience, you say? Haven't we waited six weeks for Don John's decision?
Captain Columbus? Yes. We have made our decision. Yes? You are asking His Grace Don John to risk the kingdom's gold and the lives of his subjects on a very uncertain voyage. The answer is no. I cannot accept your decision until I see Don John himself. But, Your Majesty, all this has been going on for months. I need only your permission. Columbus, you have a very ambitious plan. But why gamble on a new route? We already have a sea route partway to the Indies over the Mediterranean. But the pirating by the Turks, sire, the distance. My men are stout Columbus. They have no fear of pirates. Besides, we can sail our ships southerly around Africa by the Cape of Good Hope, thence northerly to the lands of the East. We waste time. Sailing westward to reach the Indies had become the sole purpose of life to Columbus. Years of waiting at the doors of kings had stripped him of everything except his faith in a dream and a son, Ferdinand. There remained only one country to which he could turn, France. But, Father, you are tired. The beast, too, must rest. We've a long journey, my son. Why, Father, must we go on? Were we not comfortable at Santa Fe and the king and queen, your friends? Did they not ask we stay? To be sure. They listened to our plans with one ear, while with the other they were listening to their generals. No, my son. So long as Spain is at war with the Moor, our only hope is France. Greetings, my son. Greetings, father. Have you journeyed far? All the way from Santa Fe. Come, rest. The monastery of La Rabida welcomes you. No, father. We are en route to France, and time does not permit us to wait. Time? Caution, man. If you do not think of yourself, there's this child. You will reach the mountains by sundown. Come. Your belief is strong, my son. I warned you, Father, that mine is a dream so vast that even you would mock me. No, no, my son. I will consult a friend, uh, Garcia Hernandez, who knows much about these things, and if he thinks you're right, then I will take it upon myself to go to their majesties, Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. You, father? But what better audience could you receive than I, who have been in their court for the past six years? In addition to my activities here as prior of La Rabida, Captain Columbus, I have also tutored the sons of Ferdinand for seven years past. We hold audience. thought I had got rid of this fellow Columbus. So you had, but Father Perez uses his influence where others cannot. We have decided to hear again your proposal. Having driven the last of the Moors from Spanish soil, we are now free to plan the greater glory of Spain. But your highness, the war was costly. Our treasury is almost empty. How dare we even consider new expenditures? How true, Your Highness. If perhaps the good man had a scheme to make gold instead of to waste it. Your Majesty? Yes, Santiago? Would you have appointed me treasurer of Aragon if you had thought me a wasteful man? Indeed, I would not. And you still have faith in my opinion? A short trade route west would keep our ships out of the hands of the piratical Turks and bring the wealth of the Indies to the crown of Spain. What short trade route? I have heard of none. There's no such thing. Who actually knows that? And if there is, ours will become the greatest land of the earth. And our king and queen, the most glorious rulers in all history. Or would you prefer that Columbus take his plan to the kings of France or England? What would you need? Enough to equip three ships. And for yourself? If I fail, nothing. And if you succeed? Then, my queen, I would ask to be admiral of the ocean sea and ruler of all the lands I discover thereon with the privileges of this office, and that I be named viceroy of these new lands, to rule them in the name of the king and queen for the rest of my natural life. I would naturally become a don of Spain. My family 
to rank thereafter with the houses of Aragon and Castile. And I will require one-tenth of all gold and jewels, spices Stop. and... Stop! Stop, I say! Unless the captain has forgotten something. Perhaps the throne of Spain? And I wondered why they called you a dreamer. <laughs> <laughs> Columbus was again en route to France. He was certain that his pleadings with Isabella and Ferdinand had failed. Leaving his disappointments behind, he hoped that soon, very soon, he would set sail under the banner of another king. You are Christopher Columbus? I am. Her Royal Highness, Queen Isabella, has ordered your return to Santa Fe. And so the miracle had happened. Queen Isabella had convinced the court, and the dream of Columbus had come true. The days that followed were busy ones. Queen Isabella had authorized three ships to be built, the Pinta, the Nina, and the Admiral's flagship, the Santa Maria. Every beam was set, every plank caulked under the Admiral's supervision. These were stout little ships, small to be sure by modern day comparison, but they were built to withstand the strongest winds and seas. And the crews were strong, hand-picked. A thousand stories have been told of the men who joined this most daring of all expeditions. Some say there were cutthroats, some released convicts, and still others have said they were noblemen in search of riches and adventure. Whatever their past, they had in common a spark of the same fire that inspired their leader. Columbus set sail, and it wasn't long before his expertness in navigation was the talk and admiration of the crew. Steering southward, he caught good east winds that carried him westward. Who was to say that the master mariner had not plotted his course well? As for stories of falling off the end of the sea, <laughs> these were men not easily frightened. But suddenly trouble began. The Pinta had lost its rudder. Fortunately, the Canary Islands were only three days away. More waiting, more delays. First the rudder, then re-rigging the Nina. The crews became less certain. They were leaving the last known land. What lay ahead, no one knew. Days passed, the vast unknown still lay before them. Columbus expected land any day. They had traveled in line at least 2,000 miles, and the men were growing more restless by the hour. Home began to look better to them than strange lands. Safety more glorious than riches. They begged Columbus to return. Some wept like babies. Twenty days have passed. Yes, and still no trace of land. But there has been seaweed and grass. There's sure signs of land. But, yeah. We must turn back. He who thinks differently is a fool. Right. Columbus, still unshaken in his faith, kept his ships on their course. But the decks were the scene of constant plotting. Some men swore to mutiny. Some wanted to stop it. But there were others who couldn't be stopped. Here were twigs and leaves, sure signs that land was near. Arturo, Gregory, look. Man must be nearby. Inform the crew, a silk coat to the man who first sights land. And the sun came up on the morning of October 12th, 1492, to reveal a new land. All doubts and fears were gone now. The men were happy, excited finally realizing that their captain was right. And when Columbus knelt to give thanks for his good fortune, they listened reverently. Imagine the joy of men who believed themselves doomed to die, discovering a new shore, a new hope, never knowing what dangers might be lurking there. In the name of King Ferdinand and Isabella, Columbus took the island. He named it San Salvador for the Holy Savior and he planted his sword in the name of Spain. As he grasped the sand, the soil of his new country, Columbus thanked his men and his queen. But most of all, he thanked God. For had he not the faith to go where others failed, he would never have fulfilled his mission. The riches of this virgin land were within a hand grasp. 
Each man had his dream to fulfill. There was gold to be brought home, promises to be kept. Since these were the Indies, these must be Indians. Fortunately, Columbus had made preparations for this meeting. And with beads and trinkets, the friendship of the savages was soon won. Surely there must be riches in this land, riches which could not be imagined in the Admiral's wildest dreams. But though he made three additional trips to the new land, he failed to bring back the riches expected. No gold, no diamonds, no spices. And when Queen Isabella died, Columbus lost his most important friend in court. His enemies made sport of him, and he died not knowing he had discovered a new world. Our America.